Ladies and gentlemen, and pro wrestling fans all across the globe, SummerSlam delivered in what I think might have been one of the top tier PLE slash pay-per-view events of the year. Certainly one of my favorite SummerSlams of all time. Now I know that might sound like recency bias, but with an event that had multiple matches that were serving of the caliber of main event matches. You look across the card, seven matches across the SummerSlam card, and multiple matches had the potential to carry their own main event to headline their own respective pay-per-view slash PLE. But obviously you see what I have wearing. It's obviously that of a summer vacation because the SummerSlam event always is a time that I look forward to as it wraps up the summertime in the year. And now we look forward to the fall. SummerSlam 2024 I think will go down certainly as one of the more monumental, eventful events in the WWE's history. Certainly regarding the current regime under the Triple H Paul Levesque era. There is so much to get into, but obviously, my name is Jose Ramos Jr. Thank you guys for joining me in today's reaction slash review of SummerSlam 2024, and we are starting with a hot one. That's right, the Women's World Championship. Liv Morgan defending her title against Rhea Ripley in a match that has been building for a couple years now, but only had the intensity dialed up to an 11 in recent months. Obviously, the main issue going into it is regarding the world title between the women, but as well as the allegiance, the love of Dominic Mysterio. Dominic Mysterio, who has really emerged as one of the hottest, not only in terms of his relationships, but hottest in terms of the heat in the WWE. A lot of people were wondering, myself included, where his allegiance lied. I thought heading into this matchup, personally, I couldn't trust Dominic. We saw his interactions with Liv Morgan prior to the return of Rhea Ripley, and you could see a little bit of emotion, a little bit smitten with Liv Morgan. And once we had Rhea Ripley return, you some kind of revert back to that same Dominic Mysterio who essentially was held captive and was recruited into the Judgment Day to begin with. But after seeing his interaction with Liv Morgan in last week's episode of Monday Night Raw and the week before that as well, Something told me that he could not be trusted, and it was proven to be factual. I love the matchup itself because we had told the story of Liv Morgan evading Rhea Ripley. Obviously, Rhea Ripley wanting to get on, get her hands on Liv Morgan for the amount of time that she caused Rhea Ripley to miss due to her shoulder injury. And speaking of which, that was the main theme of this match was Rhea's shoulder. How was she going to able to combat Liv Morgan, who did a wonderful job of, you know, bobbing and weaving, dodging her opponent, and attacking the injured shoulder? In fact, we did see a spot in the match where Rhea Ripley bangs her shoulder up against the announce table just to put it back into place in what was a great showing of strength and character work by Rhea Ripley. But ultimately, in the end, it was Dominic Mysterio who proved to be a pivotal point in the matchup, which was obvious to begin with. You saw the ring walk as they entered the arena, Dominic Mysterio in town with Rhea Ripley, and I thought in itself that's an interesting choice. I think Dominic Mysterio, obviously, in character, wanted to demonstrate his support for his mommy, for Rhea Ripley. But whenever you have someone at ringside, there's always that element of interference, and we saw him introduce the steel chair. Well, let's back up a little bit. Rhea Ripley had the steel chair, and Dominic Mysterio did the right thing by telling Rhea, don't use the chair. You're going to lose the matchup. You will not be able to regain the world title that you never lost if you use that steel chair. So when in that sense, it's logical. It makes perfect sense. Why would you want to risk this championship opportunity in doing so? But it would come into play when Dominic Mysterio slides the chair past Rhea Ripley, gets the official's attention, opening the door for Liv Morgan to hit the oblivion on Rhea Ripley, allowing her to retain the world championship. And if that wasn't bad enough, immediately we're thinking what's going on. It's a rehash of the King and Queen of the Ring event when Liv Morgan was able to defeat Becky Lynch for that world title. But instead, we see the smirk on Dominic Mysterio. That dirty little smirk, not unlike his Uncle Eddie or your Father Eddie, whatever, whichever storyline you want to follow. And then he begins to lift up Liv Morgan consoling her and congratulating her simultaneously before they share the 
one of the more impassioned kisses in WWE recent memory. The betrayal of Rhea Ripley certainly will, it's causing shockwaves throughout the WWE. It's asking all fans what is going to happen next. Tune in to Monday Night Raw because the state of the Judgment Day has been turned on its head and that's only the first match of the night. I think Liv Morgan versus Rhea Ripley was a great way to start. You get the energy going for the audience. You have them invested in a storyline as well as a matchup and you leave them with a little bit of a cliffhanger leading in to the main event or rather one of the main events and then going into Monday Night Raw. That would be the opening matchup. The second matchup that would follow would be the Intercontinental Championship. Sami Zayn defending against Braun Breaker and if you watch my predictions video, which I highly suggest you do because if you haven't noticed, your boy got a perfect score. If you go back, you saw how I mentioned Braun Breaker had previously lost to Sami Zayn at the Money in the Bank event. So for me personally, it was very difficult to see Braun Breaker suffering two losses to Sami Zayn. And what they did here, again, working the shoulder of Braun Breaker. We saw an early and explosive attack by Braun Breaker who was very eager to get his hands on Sami Zayn. But as the match wore on, you could tell that Braun Breaker was learning from his mistakes of that initial loss to Sami Zayn. I thought it was a well-told story. Braun Breaker hits a pair of spears before finally dispatching Sami Zayn, earning his first championship on the main roster, the new Intercontinental Champion. And I'm interested to see where we move forward here. Braun Breaker, I think, is going to be a wonderful Intercontinental Champion. I, for one, could see him holding on to this title for the remainder of the year. I don't think this is going to be a flash in the pan or a short title reign. I could certainly see him holding it past the Survivor Series, potentially at the Royal Rumble. But the real question here is Sami Zayn. Sami Zayn had an admirable reign as the Intercontinental Champion, having great matches against the likes of a Braun Breaker, Chad Gable, Dragunov, Bronson Reed, then I could name more. But now, I think it's now the opportunity to kind of propel him into the main event scene. I think naturally, we could see a rematch for the Intercontinental Champion, the rubber match if you will, perhaps at Bash at the Berlin, perhaps on an episode of Monday Night Raw. But I think now is the time that we move forward and potentially see Sami Zayn as a main eventer competing for the world championship and it's my hope that within the next year whether it's at wrestlemania whether it's by next year's SummerSlam, i would love to see Sami Zayn win the world heavyweight champion him as the main holder of the main title it would just warm my heart especially given the level of investment that wwe has placed in him the last two years certainly coming out of the bloodline and now this intercontinental championship reign and why not cap it off with a world title win? I thought it was a great matchup. Again, two solid matches to start the show. And then it kept moving forward because we had the WWE United States Champion, Logan Paul, defending his title against LA Knight, yeah, in his hometown of Cleveland. This match, for many reasons that we won't get into, a lot of people were wanting LA Knight to emerge victorious. I, for one, look at the Logan Paul situation in terms of his title reign. It had a lot of potential. But given that it was short on title defenses, not only that, but title appearances by Logan Paul. In theory, it made sense. It, it, it allowed exposure for the WWE and the United States title itself outside of the company. But you want a champion to be able to defend his title reign. I can remember back to a time in WWE when they had a policy where you had to defend your championship at 30 day intervals you could not go 30 days without defending your title without it being threatened to be stripped off of the champion so to see it on logan paul yes he's done a great job of adapting to the wwe style being that he was not a pro wrestler before signing with the company but i think the right call was to have la knight win the united states championship in what i thought was a solid matchup i was actually surprised that they gave them ample enough time to tell the story in the matchup we saw obviously logan paul jump la knight early on in the matchup and that would progress throughout we saw great spots such as the springboard moonsault from logan paul to la knight on the outside and then we had a little bit of interaction from mgk who actually walked logan paul out to the ring a lot of celebrity interaction here at SummerSlam, obviously with the performance of Jelly Roll as well. 
but MGK also hands a pair of brass knuckles to Logan Paul. It's his pan, it's his signature thing. And then he goes for the buckshot lariat, but LA Knight counters it, hitting the BFT, counting one, two, three, new United States champion, LA Knight. Yeah. Great choice, I thought there. We're so far going three for three for solid matchups. After which, we go to a fourth title matchup. There was six titled matchups, actually, in total on a seven-card, you know, SummerSlam. We had the WWE Women's Champion, Bayley, defending her title against the Queen of the Ring, Nia Jax. It what was, I thought, a slow start, but it picked up in the second half. Again, another wonderful story, I thought, between Nia Jax and Bayley. You had the underdog in Bayley who has fought off all comers who have came her way. But I like how there was a little bit of references to their NXT matchup. I believe it was NXT TakeOver London back in 2015. You saw the spots with uh, Bailey putting Nia Jax in the guillotine. I was a huge fan. You know, it got me to pop when Nia Jax was in the corner and Bailey was able to lift her up and deliver a power bomb. Again, really, you know, impressive feat of strength by Bailey, who by no means am I trying to disregard, but I didn't think she would have been capable of committing and, and successfully performing that power, fun, power bomb. But big ups to Bailey. I thought it was a, a solid matchup and then you had the fake out with the cash in attempt by tiffany stratton which i immediately when watching this i said out loud it's too early we just saw drew mcintyre cash in unsuccessfully at the money in the bank event and only one pay-per-view slash ple later we have tiffany stratton trying to cash in luckily for everybody especially for nia jackson bailey that would not be the case it would be much more of a diversion causing bailey to divert her attention to Stratton, allowing Nia Jax to get the upper hand and and and, and beat Bailey for the women's world title, excuse me, the WWE Women's Championship, which I thought was the right call. I thought especially the way Nia Jax has been booked within this last run in the WWE, it has been certainly an improvement from her previous run with the company. And I think if you want to add a little bit of credibility and relevance to these tournaments, the king and queen of the ring events, why not have one of the uh, tournament winners actually emerge victorious with their championship opportunity? But now Nia Jax, alongside uh, you know LA Knight and Braun Breaker, new champions on the card. Uh, the next matchup was the only match that did not have a title on the line. The highly anticipated, the grudge match, CM Punk, Drew McIntyre, with Seth Rollins as the special guest referee this match i think i think delivered in all aspects not only for in-ring ability but certainly for storytelling i will not sit here and and pretend like it was a five-star classic in terms of in-ring work obviously cm punk this is his first match in the wwe in a singles capacity on tv in 10 years but given that he has missed what the last seven months six and a half since the Royal Rumble because he suffered that injury. I wasn't expecting it to be an all-time classic. But what I thought they were able to do is take a, a solid match, certainly, by three of the best performers at the company that the business has to offer. And they added this layers of emotion, of storytelling that helped elevate it. You see, this matchup for me was, it was a movie. You know, people say cinema. The storytelling between Drew and Punk in itself carries. They've been telling the story well past since January. But then you add the elements of Seth Rollins who has his beef with both individuals. And let me tell you right now, the callbacks to the 97 SummerSlam had me feeling a type of way. When you had Shawn Michaels as a special guest referee for the matchup between The Undertaker and Bret Hart. And speaking of Bret Hart, how about that little tribute that CM Punk had with his gear? The Bret the Hitman Hart pink and black is great. Wonderful. And on top of that, it was early in the matchup that they introduced that steel chair. And you saw a moment when Seth Rollins was going to swing at Drew McIntyre. He dodges it. And then Seth nearly hits CM Punk with it and, and tells him, hey, you know, this wasn't meant for you. Love the callback. I love how we honor the history, the past. And just rewarding long-term viewers and fans 
by giving those little details. But in a night where I think the common theme was focus and attacking one's emotion, right? We saw that with the the uh, Women's World Championship, Rhea Ripley was trying to get a hold of her emotions. She saw blood in the water whenever she interacted with Liv Morgan. Her emotions were at an all-time high. Vengeance and revenge was, was a theme. Same thing with this matchup, as well as the next two that I will get to in a moment. But CM Punk consumed with the hatred that he has for Drew McIntyre and obviously obsessed with regaining the bracelet that bears the name of Larry, his dog, and AJ Lee, his wife. And rightfully so. I totally get that. I'm a big family man myself, so I understand where that level of animosity and that dissension that he has towards Drew McIntyre. But he had to keep his eye on the ball. At one point, he was able to regain the bracelet, and then it was disposed of, you know, on the ring. And so Seth Rollins picks it up as the referee, as the official, and he puts it on his wrist, you know, kind of just to protect it, what I'm assuming, um, for the rest of the matchup. But then there's that point where CM Punk looks at Seth and realizes he's wearing the bracelet, asking, what are you doing? Why are you wearing that? And Seth's trying to tell him, like, hey, I'm not trying to do anything. I'm just trying to hold on to it, keep it safe, you know, whatever. You got to pay attention to your match. That was that, that led to the downfall of CM Punk. CM Punk would get in the face of Seth Rollins, claiming that it may not always be about me, but it's never been about you. And in that moment, I knew Drew McIntyre. Drew McIntyre was focused. And that was one thing that led to the start of this feud was that lack of focus. Drew McIntyre took his eye off the ball at WrestleMania, causing him to get cashed in by Damian Priest. Very much so. Drew McIntyre would emerge victorious, defeating CM Punk in a fun matchup and in a really high intensity matchup and one that I don't think is over by any means which I think is obvious because Drew McIntyre at the end of the day did get back that bracelet so now Punk has more hatred towards Drew McIntyre but also towards Seth Rollins which I think will set in motion for their matchup their eventual clash of course we all knew it was supposed to be WrestleMania 40 can they hold off for WrestleMania 41 potentially Will it be a Survivor Series matchup, Royal Rumble? Who knows? I think that certainly, though, is a match worthy of WrestleMania 41. But it wouldn't be the only matchup that has a story that could lead to WrestleMania, the World Heavyweight Championship. It would be one of the more, again, one of the more highly anticipated matchups for the story, for the potential. And a card that, as I mentioned earlier, had several matches that were main event caliber matches. Damian Priest, the World Heavyweight Champion, defending his title against the King of the Ring, Gunther. This, again, if you go back to my predictions video, this was a match that not a lot of people were looking at as that match that, like, hey, I got to catch. But the WWE was able to successfully hype it up and build equity. We already have equity in Gunther because we know who he is. We know what he's capable of. But then the Damian Priest story, where you had him initially as a heel, and now crowds are cheering for him. We empathize with him. We want him to succeed. I, for one, am looking real forward to his document, his documentary on, on Monday, WWE 24. We got invested in that story. But leading up to the match, obviously the night, the question was where was Dominic Mysterio? Damian Priest, not focused. He is has He has a, a huge title match defense against Gunther who is all locked in and you're taking your eye off the ball why because Dominic Mysterio is throwing the Judgment Day off its game he got in the face of Finn Balor later in the night prior to his match against Gunther Damian Priest apologizes to Finn Balor and Finn Balor says hey it's all water under the bridge don't even worry about it you got a title match and he says all the same but I'm sorry and Finn Balor looks him in the eye and says, I'm sorry too. And in that moment, for some people who are just glancing, you're thinking, okay, they're making up, whatever. But for eagle eye viewers, and for the ones that really pay attention to the little nuances of the WWE, certainly that of the Judgment Day, Finn Balor, it wasn't I'm sorry too, as at the moment. It's I'm sorry too for what's about to happen. And what was a hard 
hitting matchup. In fact, we saw a little bit of blood sporting on the chest of Gunther in what was a hard-hitting matchup. Two contrasting styles and what turned out to be a brawl between Damien, who was not willing to give up easily to the ring general, the king general, if you will. And at one point, we did see Finn Balor emerge from the back, seemingly trying to support his Judgment Day team member. But then Damien Priest gets the upper hand on Gunther. He goes for the win, 1-2, and Finn Balor puts up the boot of Gunther on the rope, causing a rope break. And what I thought was interesting was the choice that Damien Priest didn't know. Right? He didn't know that that happened. All he knows is that his foot was on the ropes. And they jumped quickly to a a, a, um, a replay, which I thought was interesting because it was like no hesitation, cut to the replay. And then we cut out of the replay, and it's Damien Priest looking up at the Tron. And he sees what Finn has done. And Finn having his back in the slow turn. And Damien obviously concerned, obviously confused. Why? Why would you do that? And then Gunther puts him in the sleeper. And miraculously, Damien Priest breaks out of that initial sleeper hold and gets his hands on Finn. And then we see Gunther reach back, puts him back in the sleeper. And it was such a, a beautiful shot where you had Gunther on the verge of winning his first world title on the main roster, choking out the life of Damien Priest, who was forced to lock eyes with the man that cost him his title, Finn Balor. No remorse in the eyes of Finn Balor as Damian Priest passes out and we crown a new World Heavyweight Champion. Four new champions on the night thus far. Gunther going to bash at Berlin essentially as the World Champion, which I think a lot of people had predicted heading into the year. Again, another match that delivered, but I would be remiss to not talk about the Bloodline Rules match. You had Cody Rhodes in the second ever Bloodline Rules matchup. And the walk to the ring was, I, I loved it. We got to see an appearance by Pharaoh, Cody's dog. And then, seemingly in a metaphoric Cody's dog, Arn Anderson also returns to WWE in a lovely surprise, who basically praises and congratulates Cody for all the success that he's amassed throughout the course of his career, certainly in this n- new run with the WWE. And he informs him, it is bloodline rules, but just know I have a couple of connections and you have some friends on the way. The matchup itself had a little bit of a slow buildup. It did, I won't lie to you. Solo Sokoa and Cody in the feeling out process. But they found their groove. We saw a couple of Cody cutters. We saw disaster kicks. We saw great offense and control by Solo Sokoa that included the steel steps. And then eventually we had the interference of the Gorillas of Destiny, Tama Tonga, and Tongaloa with eye patch and all. Naturally, that would lead to the return of Kevin Owens and Randy Orton, which I initially didn't peg that to happen. I thought maybe they were going to get written off. But it was nice to see Randy and Kevin Owens as they made their way down the long ramp. And I'm over here yelling at them, you guys got to pick up the pace because Cody's over here getting his ass whooped. And just always great to see. And I, I'm a big fan of like the run-ins because it reminds me of the Attitude Era. And this match, along with the uh, Drew McIntyre and CM Punk match, had that kind of chaotic feel that the early 2000s had, right? But then, Randy Orton and Kevin Owens, once they get the um, the Girls of Destiny out of the ring, we all know who's missing. Jacob Fatu, man. What a beast. He nails Cody Rhodes with the Moonsaw. And then, a pop-up uh, um, Samoan drop... But the spot that I'm really concerned about was the dive to the outside on the announce table because I'm I'm hoping it's a work. But you saw him grabbing his ankle, his foot even. And he's over here screaming, throwing chairs around, and he urges Solo Sokoa to go finish the job. I'm hoping he's okay. I haven't seen anything in terms of uh, injuries or, or anything. I'm hoping if it is something, it's nothing serious because that would be a damn shame. Because Jacob Fatu obviously had just having won the tag team championships, but also because I mean he's been on fire. He's he's been the standout of this current iteration of the bloodline. So to see him go down would, would just be a travesty, really. But Cody Rhodes and Solo Sokoa continue their matchup. We see a point where Cody hits a, a huge 
Cody Cutter coming off of the top rope. Both men are down, and that's when the music hits. It has been months since WrestleMania 40, but we saw finally the return of the original Tribal Chief. Roman Reigns makes his way with a purpose down the aisle and Solo Sokoa and him locking eyes. There was a brief moment when Roman enters the ring and it kind of looked like he made an angle at Cody Rhodes, but a Superman punch would quickly find the face of Solo Sokoa, following up with a what a reaction. When he, when Roman Reigns hit the corner and hit the hoo-ah and got the spear onto Solo Sokoa, man, the place didn't have a roof to begin with, but if it did, it certainly wouldn't have one afterwards. Roman Reigns begins to leave the ring and he makes eye contact with Cody Rhodes the man that defeated him at Wrestlemania 40 for that very same championship and both kind of giving each other a nod of acknowledgement and Cody Rhodes would hit his own crossroads to defeat Solo Sokoa and I mean now it's like where do we go from here Cody Rhodes defeats another member of the bloodline and another bloodline rules match and what Cody Rhodes kind of jokingly said is basically his matchup now he's 2-0 and hasn't been defeated but Roman Reigns looking at Solo looking at Cody and I think it's fair to say that that Cody versus Roman um, feud isn't over there will be a rubber match we just don't know when but right now I think Roman has his eyes locked on Solo Sokoa and trying to determine who is well, I mean, in Roman's eyes, he is the tribal chief, but he needs to assert his dominance all over Solo and reclaim that authentic title of the tribal chief. This isn't no Ula Fala like the bloodline, but it'll be close enough. Roman Reigns returns. What a moment. I think it doesn't go without being said. I think a lot of people anticipated the return of Roman Reigns. I, for one... Um, was looking for Paul Heyman and Jimmy Uso, maybe even Jay Uso, but I think that'll come at a later date. I think, like they said during the post-conference show, um, the Bloodline still has, you know, they still have uh, uh, Solo Sokoa, the Gorillas of Destiny, Jacob Batu. Right now, it's just Roman. I think in time we will end up seeing the Usos return together as a team. Maybe Cody, maybe Sami Zayn. I, I don't know. There's still a lot of time left for war games because I think we all can assume that the bloodline will be involved in war games in some form or fashion. SummerSlam itself, what a show. What an absolute show. Each match had a storyline. Each match had a purpose. I, for one, was left amazed. Awesome. Just just fantastic. I'm looking forward now to the main stories of Raw and SmackDown. Monday Night Raw... We're going to see what the Judgment Day's fallout's going to be. What are members like J.D. McDonough and Carlito? What are they thinking? The Terror Twins, Rhea Ripley and Damian Priest, obviously have their issues with Dominic Liv and now Finn Balor. And then you look over to Gunther, the new World Heavyweight Champion. Braun Breaker, the new Intercontinental Champion. We have the Wyatt Six making their debuts on Monday Night Raw. And then you look over at Friday Night SmackDown. The Bloodline, with Roman Reigns now returning. Cody Rhodes, who is going to be his new challenger. LA Knight, the new U.S. champion. A lot of new moving pieces in the WWE right now as we really hit the halfway mark. SummerSlam is that halfway mark before we get to the Royal Rumble. And now we have a little bit of leeway, a little bit of stories to tell until we get to Survivor Series. And then before you know it, Royal Rumble leading to the road to WrestleMania. 41. But I want to know what your guys' thoughts was on SummerSlam. What was your favorite matchup? What was your favorite moment? What story are you looking forward to the most as we lead into the fall for Monday Night Raw and Friday Night SmackDown? Thank you guys again for joining me on this short little recap reaction video for the SummerSlam event. And as always, my name is Jose Ramos Jr. Thank you guys again for joining me, and I will see you all in the next one.